My name is Danielle Perez, and could I have the audience count from one to five? One, two, three.
Um, can I have you guys count off into 10? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, two, three, four, five, five, seven. All right. Uh, can I have the first three stand up? Children in the United States grow up in broken homes. Uh, you guys can sit down. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ron LaFong. Uh, according to the www.hisholychurch.org, uh, every three in ten children grow up in broken homes. Uh, today I will be discussing the effects of children growing up in broken homes. Um, some feelings that uh, are expressed by kids growing up in broken homes, and also how we can predict their future. That I have told you guys what I will be talking, uh, discussing today. Uh, the first thing, uh, according to the Telegraph newspaper article published in 2011, children that were raised in broken homes are nine times more likely to commit crimes because single family homes or more likely to be in poverty. One, um, one of the first things that kids start doing because they don't feel accepted at home is uh, getting into gangs. Um, so most kids feel like that's their acceptance, that's their getaway, that's their family because um, supposedly in a gang, that's how they feel they can uh, feel accepted. Also, number two, they start selling drugs, trying to make money because there's not enough money made in the household. So kids start selling drugs. And also they start stealing. Um, they steal stuff that they don't have, that they want, they see their friends have it, but they can't have it, so they start stealing. Um, those are the three um, main things that kids start doing that live in broken homes. Now that I've told you uh, about what kids start doing when they're in broken homes, uh, I'll move on to the effect uh, of, of kids that uh, that are living in broken homes. Uh, according to the effects of broken homes and child development, studies have shown that children are likely to feel insecure and unwanted, meaning that um, if they see that one of their parents are at home and one that's not, they feel like the other parent doesn't want them. Number two, they start being angry and sad at the world. Um, they don't know. They don't know who's. Um, caring about them, so they're mad and they don't know what to do, so they're, they're trying to find help. Sometimes they feel guilty. They feel like it's our fault, their fault, that they're not li both their parents are not together. So those are the three main points of um, how like, the feelings expressed of those kids living in broken homes. Now that I've told you the, the feelings expressed by kids that are, are living in broken homes, um, I will tell you Uh, I'll tell you the how their futures can be altered. There's one before the next. According, according to searchforhappiness.com. Oh, it disappeared just like a. Yeah, you can go ahead. Kids that are raised in broken homes determine how they, they want their future to be. Uh, most push for success, and uh, it's kind of a sense of pride. They feel like, I don't need that parent to be successful. I'm gonna show them I can do it without him. Next, uh, some will take it to the wrong route and blame others for their wrongdoings. So basically, they uh, will do their, their wrongdoings and they'll blame others, saying the reason I'm doing this is because such and such did this. So. Uh, some will have a, a huge struggle making it, but eventually they'll make it themselves, but slowly. Um, now that I told you my three main points, the three things that I want you guys to leave here with today is that children being raised in broken homes nine times are more likely to commit crimes. Three in every ten children grow up 
in the U.S. of broken homes, and lastly, being raised in a broken home can alter a child's future for the best or for the worst. Thank you. Okay, I only heard one. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I think I heard one. It's not enough. Okay, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Hello, my name is Travis Mashburn, and to start off today, I'd like to take a quick little survey. How many of you have used a device to listen to music or a program to download music in the past day? Please raise your hands. How about in the past two days? How about the last two weeks? Now, as you can see, music is very prevalent in our lives. According to Heather Lamar, Does the Music Matter? Music serves as 28% of all data consumption. Today, I'm going to talk about how popular music can affect culture, and by the end, hopefully you'll understand how popular music has affected the things that you say, the things that you do, and even some of the things that you wear. First, I'm going to talk about how popular music can create trends. Second, how popular music shapes morals. And finally, about how popular music unites society. Now that you know what I'll be talking about today, let's move on to how popular music affects culture, or creates trends. This information comes from Elijah Wald, How the Beatles Destroyed Rock and Roll. First, popular music can create dance trends. A great example of this would be the dance called The Twist. It appeared in the 1960s on a show called American Bandstand, hosted by Dick Clark, and for a year it was a very popular dance in the United States. Another good example of this would be jerking, which surfaced around 2010, or the Dougie, which surfaced in 2012. And even though these dances aren't as popular today as they were when they came out, they still had huge pop culture impacts. Second, popular music has um, integrated slang. Jazz originally was not a genre of music. It was a word that was used to describe um, how people would throw a baseball. If it had a special curve to it, they would call it a jazzy throw. It then went on to describe the sound of music and eventually became a genre. Another example would be You Only Live Once or YOLO that was created in a song called The Motto and has a huge social media impact. Finally, popular music also shapes the popular genre. A great example of this would be the Beatles in the 1960s. They created a new genre that was considered psychedelic rock and other artists tried to follow and create similar sounds so that they could sell music well and that they would have the same following as the Beatles. If you listen to music today, you can hear dance um, sounds in a lot of popular music. This is because popular music artists of today are incorporating new dance sounds, and other artists want to imitate these sounds so that they can sell music. Now that you know how popular music creates trends, let's talk about how popular music can shape morals. This information comes from Peter Manuel and Richard Middleton, Popular Music. First, popular music can shape or promote promiscuity. Originally, music wasn't allowed to sing about, or they weren't allowed to sing about um, immoral connotations because one, they didn't think the music would sell very well, and two, they wanted to keep good, wholesome images. But artists slowly kept pushing the envelope, singing about physical pleasures, and eventually, promiscuity was allowed to be used in pop music. Second, popular music can also encourage rebellion. Um, one great example of this would be protest music in the 1960s. Bob Dylan would write songs about um, the opposition of the Vietnam War, and mainly impacting youth, it helped to bring the opposition of the Vietnam War to a popular stance. Um, this also affects um, sometimes with youth the way they dress or the things they say and the way they act, and helps them to deviate from the normal. Finally, popular music can also promote drug and alcohol use. In the 60s, a lot of artists would admit to taking recreational drugs to help write their music. They would also sometimes sing about these drugs in their songs. If you listen to music today, there's a lot of lyrics that promote the use of drug and alcohol, and there are still artists today that will admit to using these substances to help write their music. Now that you know how popular music shapes morals, let's talk about how popular music um, unites society. This information comes from Gary Westfall, Ways of Defining Personal Identity in Popular Culture. First, concerts help bring fans together. Originally, concerts were only a local thing that you could only see by local bands. When the idea of touring came about, groups started touring not only their countries but the world and uniting their fans over that one common interest, the music of that artist. Second, popular music also draws people to important issues. A great example of this would be the song We Are the World. Not only was the song popular because it caught on well as a song, 
but there were so many artists that recorded vocals onto this song that it reached all um, areas and all genres of music and became a really successful song and really brought attention to hunger in Africa, which was the goal of the song in the first place. Finally, popular music and social media also work hand in hand together. For instance, Lady Gaga has over 10 million <coughs> likes on her Facebook page. That's over 10 million people that come together around the world to talk about her music and say how much they like her and they share that common interest together. Now that you know how popular music unites society, let's wrap up with three main points. First, a large portion of data goes to music, it's 28%. Some music is written to reach and impact lives. And finally, music has shaped slang, dance, and the sound of music. Thank you. My name is Mario. Um, if I just have everybody that is going to count from one to five. Four, five, one, two, three, five, 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 one, two, three, four, five, one, two. All right. Um, can all my ones stand up? According to Vita Signs, alcohol and impaired driving amongst uh, college students. One out of every five college students admits to drinking driving. You guys have problems. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the purpose of my speech is the awareness of college students and drinking and driving. Um, it's a serious, um, you know, like a debate going on right now. A lot of uh, students, or not just students, everybody uh, drinks and drives. But um, right now, like it's a big problem with, uh, amongst college students. Um, studies have shown one in every five college students are committed to drinking and driving in a four-year study. Um, and that's a um, um, the couple of my key points are we're going to have uh, for drinking and driving. No state allows a uh, blood alcohol content level, level of 0.08% or higher. And that's, um, that's all that has to do with the, uh, the amount of alcohol like for your body size. Um, there, it's not, you can't drive if you have a uh, blood alcohol content over 0.08% or higher. Uh, another one is a uh, serious injury or even death could be a result of these types of accidents and um, how to prevent drinking and driving accidents when we were going out and not. Um, accident analysis prevention, identifying factors that increase the likelihood of drinking and driving amongst college students. 2011 states that um, in 2012, almost 11,000 fatalities um, and crashes that involved a driver with a blood alcohol content of 0.08 or higher. Um, an estimated Almost 600,000 students between the ages of 18 and 24 are unintentionally injured under the, uh, under the influence of alcohol. And um, in fact, um, three in every 10 Americans will be involved in an alcohol-related crash. So um, just because you're not drinking and driving, there's other people out on the road that, um, that might be drinking and driving. And uh, I got, according to the National Highway and Traffic Safety Administration, um, serious injury or even death could be a result of these types of accidents. For fatal crashes occurring from midnight to 3 a.m., 66% involve alcohol and impaired driving. Um, if a driver has been drinking, they have less control of the vehicle. Um, alcohol impaired, like, impairs your, your driving skills, <coughs> so you might not be able to, um, you know, sense something or like you know, recognize a red light or if somebody walking the street. Like, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that come into to play with that. And, um, these types of accidents can happen at any type of rate of speed. So you could be driving on the highway or just cruising in your neighborhood and not paying attention. You could just control your vehicle and um, cause an accident where you could be injured or probably killed. Um, and uh, how to prevent these types of drinking and driving accidents. Um, the party goers plan ahead and um, you know, have a, have a plan ahead of time. They can assign a designated driver. If the designated driver ends up being too intoxicated to drive as well, Bud Light and AAA Auto Club have partnered together to start the uh, Tow and Go program. And then uh, AAA's, um, AAA's safety program reports that it has safely removed uh, more than 20,000 intoxicated drivers from the road. So um, it's, a, it's a free concept. They started this um, around 1998, and it's always around the holiday time that they, um, that they promote it to keep uh, drink, drunk drivers off the road. 
It's a free program. You call 1 800 Tow and Go, and they uh, give you a free ride home. They tow your car. So, um, kind of like, keep that as plan B or plan C. And then, um, what I want you to remember drinking and driving, you're putting yourself and others at risk. It's never okay to uh, drink and drive. Uh, chances are, if you think you can't drive after drinking, you probably shouldn't. 32% um, of all total traffic fatalities are caused by drivers, or I'm sorry, caused by drunk drivers. And that's um, you know, pretty high considering that all these can be avoided. You know, that's a lot of people that could be still alive today if these people would have taken action to a different route. And um, there are other options available to avoid drinking and uh, driving in the all right, whenever you're ready, Anthony. All right, um, how you guys doing today? My name is Anthony Paulino, and I'm going to start by demonstrating my back. Can everybody please stand up for me? Starting from over here, count from one through five, and then start over. So one, one, two, three, four, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. All right, can all my fives please sit down for me? All right, um, everybody standing right now represents the 80% of students that get good grades in college, and everybody sitting represents the 20% of students that do not. Oh. <laughs> All right, today I'll be informing you guys about the students, how many students get good grades in college, and dip about different tips and facts you guys can learn to attain these grades. My three main points starting is taking notes and reviewing them. My second main point is attending all your classes, and my third main point is being organized and alert. According to Joanna Pena, she states that students that take notes, it helps them gather information. In other words, if the teacher is lecturing to you, and you're there taking notes and getting the information, you attain the information. Now, another step to that is reviewing your notes. The other day I was in math class, and the professor put a problem on the board, and it took to the end of class, like I still couldn't understand it. But I had notes and guidelines to take home with me, so when I went home, I looked over those notes and finally I taught myself how to do the problem. Um, another fact is a possible study got out of the notes. We're, we're in college now, we're not in high school. Most professors don't give study guides for midterms, finals, tests, quizzes, so they rely on your knowledge and your notes. So these notes can serve a long way. Um, another fact is information is always handy. If we take notes, we're always going to have the information that is learned in class with us at home, anywhere, anywhere you go. So now that I have told you about taking notes and reviewing them, I will explain attending all your classes. Number one, it helps you stay on track according to John M. George. He states, he states that it doesn't let no loop in between. Like, if we don't come to class one day, we might get lazy for the next class. So let's classes stay intact. Another chance is of, you have a better chance of passing because it states that students that do come to school get A's and B's, and kids that miss fairly get C's and B's in that range, and kids that don't come to class get B's and C's. Um, another good thing about attending all your classes is that you get to hear the lecture in person. You don't have to go home and teach yourself on your own basis, you know, you can hear somebody presenting everything to you. So now that I have told you about attending all your classes, I will explain how being organized and alert can take you a long way by Hassan Randall S. Um, it helps you find items quicker, basically meaning that if you have a, a binder with different note tabs and it says notes, class assignments, stuff like that, all you got to do is flip open to those tabs and find your assignments that you're looking for. Um, using your planner helps you stay inside. I've been using this since the third grade, and it's probably one of the best techniques that I have in school with me. And um, being aware of all your class assignments also can take you a long way if you have a calendar at home and you know you drop down notes. So say a test is next week, you want to plan ahead, like you would plan for a vacation, you plan ahead. So you would want to mark like, oh, there's a test coming up, and yeah, it helps you go a long way. All right, my conclusion, the bottom line, the three facts that I want you guys to remember is that using your agenda, honesty, can take you a long way. If you don't have an agenda, you could use notes, your phone, anything. Another fact that I want you guys to remember is that taking good notes and reviewing them and keeping these notes can take you a long way as well. And my last fact that I want you guys to remember is that coming to school and attending all your classes can honestly improve all your grades. Thank you. Quiet, everybody, please. This is Mateo, whenever you're ready. All right, how's everybody doing today? If everybody can please stand up. And I'm going to ask everybody who has been a cruise ship before. 
everybody else sit down, please. How many of you have actually thought how much trash is um, developed by the crews and where does it go? And if you haven't, please sit down. If we have thought about it? Yeah, if you actually thought about all of them. I know they dump something in the ocean. All right. So, now I'm going to talk to you about how many, how much trash in a normal 3,000 passenger cruise ship develops in just one week. And it's about eight tons a week, and most of it is on it ends up in the ocean. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Pacific Ocean Trash Board. And the Pacific Plastic Board is, um, I'm going to be talking about my three main points, which is the plastic, uh, the, what is the Pacific Plastic Board, is, where it's located, and what can we do about it. Um, what is the Pacific Plastic uh, Vortex? It's pretty much a dump, the largest dump of garbage in the United States, well, all over the world. And what it mainly consists of is plastic, which is 90% of it, uh, tires and garbage, um, say garbage, trash bags. And it's about twice the size of Texas. Full plastic and 90% of it is non degradable. Now that I have talked about what is the plastic, uh, the plastic board is, I'm going to talk about where is it located. It's located off the coast of Hawaii, um, Baja California, and a little bit of Canada, and off the coast of Japan, and most of the side of it, the east continent. Um, it's mainly fed by the rivers that go from Baja California onto the ocean. And the trash can normally take up to a year to 10 years to get to this, to this part of the ocean. It's estimated to have to be around five hatches in the whole world. Um, around one million animals and sea turtles and birds die each year because of this problem. Mainly because the, the bottles that we throw out have caps. The caps cannot be recycled. These animals mistake the caps by food, take it to the nest, and give it to the baby. Uh, there have been um, a lot of animals that actually been found and full of their stomach with full of caps, just plastic. Now that I talk about what is the uh, where it's located, we're going to talk about what we can do about it. What can we can do about it? Pretty much. Nothing. Why? Because it's so big that no nation in the whole world can actually afford to do anything about it. Um, what can we do to stop it and its roots? Pretty much the only thing we can do is try to stop it by the rivers, trying to clean it a little bit, but at the end of the day, we can't really do anything. There's a lot of foundations that are trying to go out into the Pacific, be able to get some trash out or anything like that, but tell you the truth, nothing can not come out of that. Um, the three main things I would like for all of you to remember is there's no place in the world we can find any plastic or any trash at all. Um, pretty much any animal we eat, any fish, has it in either eating plastic or has it in a fish that has it in plastic. So there's no product in, that comes from the sea that has no plastic in it. Um, each year, millions of animals die, including birds, from sea turtles, from fishes. And Bordix is a massive, um, pretty much landmade structure simply because we cost it, it's really big, we can't do nothing about it, and sadly, our kids are just going to have to deal with it for the rest of our lives. Thank you very much. Whenever you're ready. Oh, thank you. My name is Hazel, and to begin, I would like to start planning you off from 1 to 5. Start over here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Today I will be talking about eating disorders and, 
and by the end you will know how to prevent it from happening to someone you love. First of all, I will talk about the types of eating disorders. Second, about the causes of eating disorders. And lastly, about the recovery. Now that you know what I will be talking about, I would like to begin by talking about the types of eating disorders. This information comes from Tom Thompson's 2011 article in eating disorders. First of all, anorexia. Anorexic are always obsessed with being thin. They fear gaining weight, they refuse to eat, and they overexercise. All of this they do it because they want to cope with problems, no matter if they are with friends, families, school, they do it because they need to get away from the problems. Second type is bulimia. Bulimic often eat all the food at once, called binge, and they to remove the food from the body, they often make themselves throw up or use laxatives to remove the food from the body, called purging. Bulimics typically stay in their normal weight. They overuse laxatives and diet pills, and they dramatically gain weight followed by drastic weight loss. And the last one is compulsive eating, overeating. This type is not well known. Most people will know about it, but it's another type of eating disorder. The individual feels like they need to eat all the time, like they're out of control, like they can't resist. They always need to eat, no matter what. They often eat large amount of foods. They often do it alone and in secret because they will they will feel ashamed that they are eating so much. Now that you know what I'll be talking about, about the types, I'll start to talk about the causes of eating disorders. This information comes from our anorexia survival guide. Those suffering from eating disorders most of the time are affected by peer pressure. Like if they try to fit in and people start making up one of their weight or anything, they will do anything to lose the weight, no matter what, no matter if it affects their health or harms them, and become becoming an eating disorder. Another another cause would be child trauma and sexual abuse. Sexual abuse. They they might start feeling worthless and feel feeling ashamed of themselves, and they will start to create bad eating habits, and that will just go and lead on to eating disorder. Stress and depression also played a role in, in eating disorders. And lastly, genetics. Um, genetics also play a role in eating disorders. They have found that it would be hereditary, that it would be passed down to, from families and family members. Now that you know what I'll, about the causes, disorders, I will go on to recovery. According to the National Eating Disorder Association, the individual needs to recover from eating disorder because this illness kills millions of Americans every year. First, for the recovery goal, the individual needs help and support from family and friends. Each individual needs an individual plan that you need plan because everyone recovers differently. They're not all the same. And most importantly, they need to admit to the problem because you cannot help somebody if they don't want to be helped. And lastly, there are many churches and eating disorder centers that are glad to help anyone that is suffering from an illness. Now that you know the recovery, I will recap some main points that I want you to remember. There are three major eating disorders. Eating disorders affect every, everyone, no matter what. And eating disorders are a serious problem that kills millions of Americans every year. 